Good morning. I'm uh, Igor Pashti from the Faculty of Physical Chemistry, University of Belgrade. Uh, I will be a moderator for, for session three, Advanced Basic Research in Chemistry and Biology for this first part of, of the session. Uh, I'm a, a material scientist, so this is very new and interesting for me, and hopefully uh, it will be interesting for everybody. And uh, the plan is to have four lectures, around 20 minutes, and then we have another 20 minutes for discussion. Uh, so uh, I would like to announce the first lecturer. It's uh, Roman uh, Yerala uh, from the National Institute of Chemistry, uh, Ljubljana, Slovenia. Uh, with a talk entitled Synthetic Biology for Engineering Protein Structures and Function, uh, Function and Cellular Circuits. Dragomir, that's an order. Hvala na gostoprimstvu. Dear colleagues, I'd like to present you today uh, Synthetic Biology, the, the area that I'm quite uh, passionate about and I think fits nicely within this international year of uh, 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 basic sciences for sustainable uh, development. So let me start with the first uh, thing that I'm most uh, fascinated about, which is the tiny seed. The, the, the seed is, is really a miracle. I mean, it's sort of the technology by nature that, that has not been achieved by, by, by humans because seed contains all the information to make such a wonderful uh, organism such as a tree or, or, or a forest. Uh, so now with the uh, development of uh, uh, technologies, uh, particularly synthetic biology, we're able entering into the area where, where we're able to redesign <coughs> biological systems. Uh, so synthetic biology is at the interface of engineering and biological sciences, so it uh, applies engineering principles into the biological systems, but also takes biological principles and introduces them into engineering. So. Uh, Biological systems have many principles that are, would be great to apply in our technology. So they are uh, atomically precise, so they are uh, structured at the nanoscale, they are able to self-assemble, self-replicate, they are sustainable, they have high energy and material efficiency do, through recycling, they are robust, uh, uh, able to uh, adapt to the environment, they are able to, to evolve really many, many of the, the features that would be great to implement in our uh, uh, technology. Uh, potentials of synthetic biology are, are, are in many different uh, areas, uh, so today I'll focus mainly on health because that's the area where we are mainly uh, working on uh, uh, with, with many potential applications that are already being applied, uh, then chemicals, but this includes also carbon conversion, fuel and so on, material sensors, information uh, processing and, and storage. But since we're talking about basic sciences, synthetic biology has also uh, implications for fundamental understanding of, of, uh, of biological systems. As Richard Feynman famously wrote on a blackboard, what I cannot create, I do not understand, which is a principle that, that is righteously adapted by, adopted by, by synthetic biology. Because in biology, we're quite often knocking out one gene after another, but which provides some information, but still only if we are able to assemble uh, cells, to make synthetic cells from, from well understood uh, uh, building blocks, only in this case we'll be able to truly understand what is life, what, what are the basic uh, requirements for, 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 for uh, living uh, organisms. <clears throat> so let me start with proteins, which are the, the major uh, workhorses in, in all cells. So proteins are uh, really uh, making most of the function in, in systems. So they're catalyzing reactions, they're they providing uh, the, the, the scaffolds. And, pro and this is done due to their tertiary structure, due to the function of proteins, which is defined by linear amino acid sequence, which provides all the information to self-assemble into a well-defined uh, tertiary structure. Here I have to mention the, the really important uh, breakthrough that occurred a couple of years ago by AlphaFold and, and uh, programs that are uh, uh, evolved from it based on machine learning, which enables us to really more reliably predict the tertiary structure based on the amino acid uh, sequence. <coughs> but on the other hand, it's important to realize that natural proteins represent only a tiny fraction of all possible uh, structures. Uh, the number of possible amino acid structures is, is more than astronomical. In fact, the number of, of uh, 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 
small hundred amino acid residues exceeds, vastly exceeds the number of atoms in the universe, which means that nature could ne not have tested all the possible uh, sequences. So there's a vast sort of dark space of, of uh, protein sequences and, and structures that are for us to, to discover and uh, invent. So uh, we are really having the opportunity not just to design uh, uh, new sequences, but also new protein folds and moreover, new principles of, of design of proteins that have not been adapted by, by, by uh, nature. Uh, so here I'll uh, present one of those examples that was done in our group. Uh, it's fascinating to, to uh, uh, monitor the, the DNA nanotechnology, if you're uh, familiar with it, where uh, scientists have uh, uh, repurposed uh, uh, nucleotide uh, uh, sequences for something completely different, to, to design new types of, of structures based on simple complementarity of, of, of base pairs, which enable them now to, to make almost any uh, selected shape to, to, to make different uh, molecular machines. Uh, and we had the idea to, to use, uh, adapt something like that on, on proteins, namely to build proteins from modular building blocks uh, resembling the, the principles of, of DNA nanotechnology. In order to do this, we have to have uh, building blocks that are similar to the complementarity of, of uh, base uh, pairs. And we realized that coiled coiled dimers are, are such an excellent building block because with coiled coiled dimers, we can design the sequences based on the uh, hydrophobic interactions and electrostatic interactions to design peptides that specifically bind to each other. And moreover, we can design them to assemble in a defined uh, orientation. So they can uh, make under either anti-parallel orientation such as DNA, but we can also make them to make uh, uh, parallel uh, uh, dimers. Uh, so this can be done simply by <coughs> de novo designing the, the, the sequences based on, on this complementarity at hydrophobic and electrostatic positions, which enabled us to, to design a set of orthogonal peptide pairs, which means that if we mix those pep peptides in, in the solution, only designed pairs will, will pour, form uh, dimers, but not uh, with others. So we have expanded the, the set of those orthogonal uh, building blocks to about 20, which is, is in, in fact uh, much larger than, than we have known from, from, from nature. And the basic idea is the following. So we want to concatenate those building models together in the single long polypeptide chain. And if the two segments are complementary in a defined orientation, they will form a called called dimer, which will form a, a part of the scaffold of the, of the final structure that we want to build. So here, if we uh, continue, uh, so we want to milk some, some polyhedra. <coughs> and with polyhedra, you can make almost any, any type of shape. So the idea is that we want to make structure where the edges of polyhedra are composed of a called called dimer. So the task is really to design the pathway of the polypeptide chain. So it will traverse each of the uh, edges of the called called dimers exactly twice, forming a stable, a stable, a stable uh, tertiary uh, structure, uh, a new type of scaffold. So this is, in fact, a new principle, not just a new protein fold, but a new principle of designing protein folds different from natural proteins, where the fold is defined by the hydrophobic packing of amino acids in the core, while in this case, it the, depends on topology, the order of, of, of segments of uh, polypeptide chain. And for this, we can use mathematical principles. In fact, uh, Leonhard Euler solved this problem uh, 300 years ago in, in solving the, the riddle of uh, Königsberg's bridges and uh, made a, a foundation of, of mathematical topology. And if we apply his rules to our to our uh, tetrahedron, we can, we can show that, that we can make such a trail, a double Eulerian trail, and with help of our colleagues mathematicians, they prove that it is possible to make any type of polyhedra using this type, this type of, 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 of principles. So the first structure that we wanted to design is a tetrahedron, which is the simplest three-dimensional uh, scaffold that we can make. So tetrahedron is composed of six edges, which means 12 called call forming segments that are connected into a single polypeptide chain. So that's completely the novel designed uh, polypeptide uh, chain. And indeed, the structure that we analyzed uh, uh, confirmed by, by using small angle X-ray scattering and, and electron microscopy that we indeed get this uh, tetrahedral cage with characteristic cavity inside with the edges of a polyhedron about uh, five 
uh, nanometers. So that's completely a new uh, designed uh, fault that, that has not been found in nature. So we made a, a modeling pipeline uh, to, to where we select the, the shape of a polyhedron and, and select the building blocks and end up with a sequence, uh, amino acid sequence, which we can then introduce into the, into the uh, cell factory bacteria or, or uh, uh, other cells to, to make this type of uh, polypeptide. In addition of tetra to tetrahedron, we also made a, a rectangular prism. We also made a trigonal prism that were confirmed to fold into the desired shape by, by Sachs and uh, electron uh, microscopy. And moreover, we showed that uh, those structures can be also expressed and self-assemble into mammalian cells and also in vivo in, in, in mice without of causing any adverse effects so cells treat them just like any other uh, normal protein so we see of course many potential applications to to design vaccines to to deliver uh, drugs to to encapsulate enzymes and, and 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 so on we are also able to regulate the assembly of those cages in this case by proteolysis by positioning the inhibitory peptide here at the interface and by cleavage of protease, the peptides are released and this uh, tetrahedra assemble into the trigonal uh, bipyramid. We can use selected type of proteases, we can use viral or any other types of proteases to recognize this and, and uh, assemble. We can also regulate the assembly by chemical signals, in this case by zinc ions, by introducing the binding sites into the interface and the, by the addition of zinc ions we assemble this uh, uh, trigonal uh, bipyramid. So in the second part of my presentation I'm switching to more towards uh, more specific uh, health applications regulation of uh, mammalian cells. Uh, there are many potential applications therapeutic applications uh, uh, in, in, in mammalian cells where we want cells to sense uh, some type of signal let's say pathogenic uh, pathological signal or to respond to some type of uh, external signal where we want the cells to let's say be less active or to start producing some some, some, some types of uh, drugs and we can introduce this type of logic in, into the cell by using, uh, of course, uh, DNA or uh, RNA. In, in a way, this uh, resembles uh, programming by, of electronic circuits where the, the, we are, humanity is very good at, at, at designing many complicated electronic circuits. In this case, the, the logic gates are connected by, by, by conductive wires. In cells, we don't have any conductive wires, but we're using molecules such as transcription factors to, to translate different types of signals and activate uh, selected uh, genes. Uh, we are nowadays able to design proteins that bind to specific sequences of, of, of DNA, uh, such as with TAILS or with uh, CRISPR-Cas, and in this way we can make uh, either uh, inhibitors of uh, expression of selected genes or, or activators. In effect, we can make them for any selected human gene to up or, 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 or down regulate it. Uh, in a way, we can also start introducing uh, similar type of binary logic as electronic circuits such as <coughs> NOR gate which we can implement by positioning two types of repressor upstream from, from the reporter so in this case the output is uh, active uh, only if none of the, the two signals are, are present we can extend this uh, to triple uh, NOR gates and this is important because NOR gates are as you probably know functionally complete logic functions which means that we can make any type of logic gates using just uh, NOR gates. In, in fact, a guidance computer on Apollo 11 was composed of a circuit componing, uh, co consisting only of triple uh, NOR logic gates. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, we, we simply, uh, instead of positioning here the uh, reporter, we, we make another regulator that will couple together with other regulators and, and uh, produce uh, required uh, logic, which is demonstrated here in case of uh, XOR uh, logic function, which is demonstrated on living mammalian cells using different types of reporters. So in this case, XOR logic provides an output only if the two inputs are, are, are different. And as I mentioned, we can make any type of binary logic function using just this type of designable repressors, we can, which we can make in thousands of, uh, thousands of, 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 of examples. Those types of regulations have one drawback that they're relatively slow, so they respond uh, responses within sort of an hour, several, several hours. 
but cells have other types of uh, system to, to respond faster, namely by, by, using, uh, uh, by using modification of proteins, phosphorylation or proteolysis. In this case, the pool of proteins is already present and when the signal uh, is, is present, the proteins can be rapidly converted into, into the uh, active state. Therefore, we try to implement this type of faster uh, uh, logic in, in, into cells by using uh, proteases. We can, uh, uh, we can modify the proteases, the, the enzymes that, that cleave specific uh, target sites by introducing the binding site for chemical signal. So in this way, we can make the activity of the protease depend on the, on the chemical signals. There are tens of uh, uh, different, uh, very specific uh, plant proteases, such as tobacco H virus protease with, with different uh, cleavage uh, sites that, that can, can uh, work at the same time in mammalian cells. And the second component that we require is specific substrate that is cleaved by, by the protease. In this case, we have an auto-inhibitory uh, arrangement preventing the interaction between those two peptides. And when it's cleaved by the protease, <coughs> inhibitory peptide is removed and we, we get this activation. So the whole system works like that. Uh, so we add a chemical signal that activates this uh, protease, which cleaves the, of the auto-inhibitory peptide and restore the activity of a selected uh, peptide, uh, protein, in this case, uh, a reporter. So in a similar way as before, we can now make the, the all uh, uh, two input uh, Boolean logic circuits inside, inside uh, mammalian uh, cells. And as I mentioned, the main advantage is speed. So the response, if we compare it, transcriptional activation takes uh, several hours to, to respond and this response is uh, much faster by using uh, chemical, uh, by using uh, this, uh, as we call it, uh, Spock logic. As you can see here, response occurs already within a couple of minutes. This is within living mammalian cells. Uh, so it, there's some time required for the signal to enter the cells and, and activate uh, those proteases. We have also uh, uh, used a different type of uh, uh, <coughs> system for the secretion of proteins. So the first one was for the cytosolic proteins, but I can explain the difference if, if somebody wants afterwards. So in this case, uh, we don't have several hours to wait for the insulin to, to increase. Uh, so we, it has to respond faster. And as you can see here, this response is much faster in comparison to the transcription activation. We, also, we can also regulate secretion of anti-inflammatory protein and we can also regulate the activity of chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which is the sort of a, uh, probably the most stellar example of uh, synthetic biology where we're using engineered uh, uh, T cells to, to target uh, cancer cells. And sometimes the response can be excessive, so it's, it's uh, just too strong. So it would be an advantage to be able to regulate the activity of those proteases by chemical signal. And in this case, we can regulate by, by this chemically regulated protease, the, the tra tra transport of this car to the plasma membrane to, to trigger activation. So those are uh, T cell line responding to the, the B cells. So to end uh, with uh, challenges and potentials, I think that the future is extremely bright. So I have uh, described only uh, a tiny fraction of synthetic biology. So as I mentioned, it's uh, also has potential in many different areas, but uh, par particularly in the uh, areas that I have uh, uh, described, it has uh, many uh, abilities to design uh, molecular designed molecular machines with, with diverse uh, health applications, uh, also uh, therapeutic applications with, with, uh, with, uh, uh, for, for the regulation of mammalian cells. So to end with a quote of uh, Pablo Picasso, others have seen what is and ask why, I have seen what could be and asked why not. So I would like to end with uh, uh, acknowledging uh, colleagues and collaborators that contributed to this work and also with uh, funders for, for this. Thank you. Okay, so it was a perfect timing. Uh, so the next speaker is Jan Hoymakers uh, from the Netherlands uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Koi Makis will be joined uh, online. Uh, the title of his talk is uh, DNA Repair, the Contribution of Basic Sciences to, un to uh, Understanding the Process of Aging and Promote Healthy Aging. Something that we're all very interested in, I guess. Yes, uh, very much. I hope the transmission works and 
Let me start by apologizing that I am uh, online only and not physically present. Um, but I hope that transmission works. I will share my screen and uh, hope also that audio will work. Otherwise, let me know. So indeed, um, I would like to talk about some work that we are doing um, that is very related to DNA damage and aging. So I uh, hope that the presentation now is in presentation mode. Um, I'm affiliated with four or five institutions, uh, but uh, I'm not, um, I have no uh, commercial uh, conflict of interest. Um, let me see. I hope I share, is it okay? I hope yeah, that's... It's, uh, it's fine, yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So, um, yes, I would like to talk about DNA repair and the contribution of basic sciences to understand the process of aging that we all experience and to promote healthy aging. And I'll promise an, an, an amazing story. So, um, we work already for a long time to understand DNA damage and its consequences. DNA, of course, is the blueprint of life and that contains all the genetic information that makes us as we are, but it is constantly damaged from outside exogenously, UV, radiation in space, for instance, too, but numerous chemicals in food, water, damage DNA, but endogenously our own cells produce, for instance, reactive oxygen species, ROS, but mechanical stress or water also damage DNA constantly. And every cell in every body, in, in, all, in all of our body, every cell experiences we think, up to 100,000 lesions per day. And of course, since DNA is at the base of life, the consequences, it will affect DNA metabolism. And one of the consequences is already known for a long time, namely that if you, if you duplicate a damaged DNA template, there is a higher chance you make a mistake. So you get um, mistakes during replication and chromosome segregation, mutations and chromosomal aberrations. And this is the root cause, the main cause of cancer. So cancer is already a huge medical problem, but there is another problem linked with DNA damage. And that is on the, uh, on the, on the other side. So there are lesions like interstrand crosslinks or breaks or bulky adducts on DNA that block the, the transcription, so when an RNA copy is made from a DNA, from a, from a gene, and that leads to transcription stress. It may also block replication, and that leads to replication stress. And that will trigger when the cells are dividing, a delay in cell cycle progression, maybe transiently to try to fix the damage before you, you make mistakes, or to permanently arrest cell cycle, cell cycle division, that is leading to senescence. And it may also affect transcription, the function of the DNA, and thereby the function of the cell, or cells may die. And all of these consequences, we think now, are the main cause of systemic aging. And fortunately, there are repair systems that are constantly fighting back, that try to detect the damage and repair before it leads to these consequences. But even with normal repair, like you and me, um, some things are not detected or not repairable or sometimes repair is there too late or it makes mistakes and with aging repair may decline. So still, despite potent repair, there are still DNA lesions that accumulate in time causing cancer and systemic aging as we know. And of course, all of this will be uh, uh, accelerated when you have a repair defect. Unfortunately, I have no time to explain to you how, what we know about repair mechanisms. There are multiple of them. I can only show you, you know, one of the consequences, and um, these are all very rare diseases that occur when you are born with a DNA repair deficiency. And uh, the, the first syndrome that I would like to introduce, one uh, in, a, in a hundred thousand to a million, is cocaine syndrome. Um, these children have very severe narrow developmental abnormalities and a life expectancy of about only 12 years. And that is due to a defect in a pathway, repair pathway that is called transcription coupled repair. So when DNA damage stalls transcription, then this pathway normally would help out, but in these children not. And this is a French patient, three years old, Baptiste, you see already neurologically some abnormalities, but four years later, you see that the child is very small, 
needs glasses, hearing aids, these children cannot walk, cannot talk, they are, and they are progressive pining. You see cachexia, sarcopenia, and Baptiste only became 10. And for comparisons, you see his sister, uh, she is one year older. So the disease is devastating. And we didn't have any medication, but I'll come back to that later. So another disease making the situation even more puzzling is called trichothiodystrophy, TTD. Uh, very similar to, not, but not identical to cocaine, because these children have many of the features of cocaine, but on top of that, they have something very peculiar. They have brittle hair, brittle nails, scaly skin. And in this case, another pathway, also in repair, is affected, which is called nucleotide exist repair. So these, uh, this is a multi-organ accelerated aging syndrome, primarily in the post-mitotic tissues, the tissues that do not divide, the neurons, the liver, the kidney, the skeleton, but not so much the hematological system, which is constantly renewing. So, um, and that is called segmental aging, and this, this, these diseases point to a link with transcription, because transcription coupled repair is affected. So one way to try and better understand how these complex diseases, how they emerge, is to try to make the very same mutation of the patients in the mouse. And that is what we did. So uh, I show you, we have made many mice. I show you only one, which we think is the most all round mouse in terms of uh, aging and repair, because it's, it's, it's affected in a repair gene, which has the name ERCC1. Uh, I don't have uh, I don't have time to explain what the gene is doing, but it is involved in four repair systems. So, and in this case, you see uh, um, aging in all organs. Not it is not segmental like in the previous disease because that is with one repair system. But now we see aging everywhere in the brain, in the heart, in the in the skeleton. You see kyphosis, bending of the spinal cord, the liver, the kidney. The, the muscles, fat tissue, the skin, uh, wherever we look, also the hemopoietic system this time. And this mouse lives about four to six months because it's not a complete knockout because that is not, not viable in, in many backgrounds, but it, is, it shows multi-morbidity, which, which we have also with normal aging. So you, don't, you never age in one organ only, you age over your own body. And it shows what spontaneous DNA damage apparently can do when you have re repair defects like this one. So um, this mouse we predict will be extremely valuable for neurodegeneration, Alzheimer, Parkinson, and so on. I'll come back to that uh, later for a, a brief moment because I have many things to tell. So what we also discovered, we have made many mouse mutants uh, that uh, have defects and all of them, um, they live short and many of them show they, are, they, they stay small, like the child that I showed you. But these short-lived repair mutants, when we analyzed all, all the genes in the liver, the kidney, and in many other organs, something striking we found was that they, they suppress their growth and they upregulate resilience mechanisms, antioxidant defenses, stress resistance, maintenance systems, above growth. And it's an attempt, we think, to extend their short lifespan. And this explains why these cocaine syndrome children and the mouse mutants stay tiny. So, um, and we call this, this response, we call it a survival response because it also resembles calorie restriction. If you have too little food, the body is very wise. It doesn't waste it into growth. It wants you to survive. And constant calorie restriction is constantly more maintenance, means you delay aging. So, now we want, you know, these mice that we have and that are suppressing their growth, but we gave them food all the time and limited. So what would happen when we would actually apply calorie restriction to these mice? So that is what we did. And this was an eye-opening obs eye observation. Uh, this is the normal um, lifespan of the, the mice that I showed you before. Um, when they have unli unlimited food, the first mouse dies by 12 weeks, as you can see, and the last one is dead by 27 weeks. This is the lifespan that, we, that I already explained. So the other half of the mice we put on a diet. So from week seven onwards, we reduce calorie intake up to 30% of what in, uh, 30% less of what they normally eat, and then followed what happened, and then this happened. So they lived 
from the moment you put them on a diet, they live three times as long. And median as well as maximum lifespan is unequivocally strongly uh, extended. So um, that is extreme for mammals, but we wondered what happens to health. So we looked in the liver, the kidney, the immune system, retina, and neuronal system, particularly the neuronal system uh, benefited most, but all organs and systems unequivocally, the aging is delayed. I'll show you the neuronal effects because that is on this slide. Uh, are two mice. Uh, uh, yes, I hope, uh, sorry, I hope that it, uh, the movie works. Uh, yeah, I don't see it moving, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, but you have seen, you, here are two um, litter mates. And I think, yeah, this normally should work. No, it doesn't. Um, so, um, these are two litter mates. One of them had unlimited food on the right, and the other one uh, on the left uh, was on calorie restriction. And they are neurologically very different. The mouse on the right could barely walk and barely crawl, and the mouse on the left uh, walks like normal. If you put them on a rotating rod, and I'm, I'm afraid, ah, this one works, hopefully, yeah. So, uh, yeah, now you see that 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 uh, adlibitum food dropped already in the first round, and the, now the, the the mouse that had that, that is the wild type on diet was falling three minutes later. Maybe I start this movie again because I think now I know why it didn't work. Ah, yeah. So here um, the uh, mouse on the right with unlimited food, logically shaking, cannot control its muscles. Is, uh, is has balance problems, cannot keep normal balance. Whereas the mouse on the right, which was on the uh, on the diet, uh, sorry, the mouse on the left, um, that mouse can run around. You see, it cannot it cannot keep balance, and the mouse on this mouse can run around uh, like uh, normal. So if you put those two mice on a rotating rod, so accelerate rotation, I'll start a the movie, then the ad libitum mouse falls out first already in the first round. And the uh, wild type mouse on the diet is still staying at the end until uh, this one also drops, but the mutant on the diet is still running. So the difference between 30% less food in neurological uh, uh, respects couldn't be bigger. So if this, if this would work uh, also in the patients, instead of 12, they might become three times as long, uh, they live three times as long, 36 years and would be in a much better condition. But of course, mice are not humans, and these children, they are fragile, tiny, get extra food. So we now write this in children. And this is the first patient because it was very counterintuitive and controversial because these children all get extra food because they don't grow. But this is uh, a TTD patient with little hair that I showed you in the beginning, uh, Emma, she is uh, six years old. These children cannot walk, cannot talk, cannot read and write. And she got 1150 kilocalories directly, directly in the uh, She had no appetite uh, directly in the stomach. Bravo. She will see, like the mice, the children cannot walk. They can barely crawl, shaking. <laughs> also, the, the neurons cannot control the muscles. You see the little hair by the way. So uh, this child had no appetite. This is a progressive disease. Uh, prognosis is very unfavorable. And many children don't get older than five or seven. So we, um, we, we reduced calorie intake in, in, in her case, gradually to 850. And then she lost her tremors. And something happened like this. So in a few months later, she started. She was able to walk and keep balance. Instead of declining, she very much improved. And she now walks in. Sorry. She also started the first time in her life. Not only to count, but also because before. She could not even, she was not able to speak, to pronounce words. And now she was able to speak. Emma. Oh, sorry. And now she started even to write her name, Emma. She didn't need diapers. She starts to bicycle. And now four years later, 
she is still alive and doing extremely well. So Emma, seven years, could barely crawl, not walk, talk, develop tremors, progressively decline, poor prognosis. We reduced calorie intake and now she can walk, she can talk, she's interactive, she is in a good mood, she learns, she's now even learning to read. And now the guidelines for all of these children have been completely reversed. So how can that restriction, how does it delay aging? So with aging, we, and I have no time to show you all of the evidence because there's a lot of evidence that backs up what I now uh, present on this single slide. DNA damage accumulates, affects gene expression, particularly in tissues with no re cell renewal or a low cell renewal rate, like the neurons, the liver, the kidney, the skeleton, many organs actually. They, they don't, do not cell renew and their DNA damage can build up and that leads to a lower and disbalanced gene expression profile. And that causes cells to dysfunction and cells to die in the end and that leads to aging. And dietary restriction, by redesigning metabolism, reduces the DNA damage load and thereby preserves gene expression and thereby allows, for instance, neurons to keep functioning better and to delay aging. And this survival response is, has an enormous medical impact as we now are exploring. Because calorie restriction and also if you short-term fast, so for through Two to three days, do not eat, only drink, but no food, no calories, then you induce this, what we call survival response that delays aging, that upregulates your antioxidant defenses. And if you do this prior to any surgery, surgery leads to um, uh, chemia perfusion uh, damage. So now if you, if you fast prior to surgery, which is very counterintuitive, you upregulate your antioxidant defenses and you strongly protect from the massive oxygen radical damage that occurs when, when the surgeon allows blood to enter the area that had no blood for a long time and that causes enormous damage. But at that moment, if you have upregulated your antioxidant defenses, you have much less uh, consequences from the surgery. And the same principle applies to chemo and radiotherapy in cancer treatment. So, Short-term fasting prior to chemo or radiotherapy puts your body in a much more strong defensive mode and the side effects of the cancer therapy, the chemotherapy, which damages your DNA, you improve the short and long-term consequences, the side effects for all ex-cancer patients or cancer patients that are currently on treatment. And finally, reduced calorie intake also reduces DNA damage that preserves the neurons. And so we think that it also is very important for counteracting progression of Alzheimer, Parkinson, frontotemporal dementia, all dementia where proteins start aggregating. As we saw Emma, the patient that I showed you before. This helped us to understand the basis of aging. And aging is something with which all of us, hopefully in the end, are confronted, but we would like to promote healthy aging. So hundreds of years of medical progress and all you can tell me to do is eat less. Yes, we think nutritional interventions and traditional memetics perhaps in the future may change medicine. So this is our laboratory. Uh, oh, not that cook, a look, a look in our laboratory. Uh, and uh, the mice that were extremely important for these studies, mice are extremely valuable models for these diseases. Uh, these are the people that have participated uh, in the past and are still participating in the work that I presented. Uh, I, have, I apologize, I can't show all and mention all their names. The funding agency was so kind to support our work, but I'm very grateful for this uh, child. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for this extremely interesting lecture. Uh, save your questions to discussion. And uh, we have a uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Zhao from uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana uh, Champaign, uh, USA. Uh, the title of the talk is Direct Directed Evolution of Enzymes and Microorganisms for Sustainable Development.
Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my name is Huimin Zhao. I'm from University of Illinois at Banana Champaign. I would like to thank uh, the conference organizers for giving this opportunity. And today I'm going to talk about uh, how direct evolution could be used for enzyme engineering and uh, microbial cell engineering for sustainable development. Okay, just use this one, yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, direct evolution actually is uh, one of the, the most powerful biotechnologies that ever developed. Um, as you know that the biotechnology uh, industry is growing very rapidly. Uh, it was initially actually uh, mainly focused on the medical or the health uh, industry and then later applied to agricultural industry and more recently industrial biotech, uh, uh, industrial industry. Um, and I listed here, you know, those uh, major uh, tools that actually were developed over the past few decades that uh, uh, drive the development of the biotech industry. And I include the direct evolution here. And also should point out uh, that uh, you know, most of the inventors for these technologies actually got a Nobel Prize in the, in the past uh, um, few decades. And direct evolution actually is a very simple yet a very powerful um, design algorithm. Uh, starting from the target gene or the pathway or even the whole genome, we introduce uh, mutagenesis, uh, in introduce the mutations by either random mutagenesis or in a, a DNA recombination. So we create a library of uh, uh, variants, and then we apply screening or selection method to find the, the ones that uh, show the improvement. Um, and then we will uh, repeat this cycle you know, again and again, right? So it is, uh, as you can see, basically to mimic the Darwinian evolution process in the test tube. And so, um, the 2018 Nobel Prize uh, in Chemistry was given to the pioneers uh, in this field, uh, including my former PhD advisor, you know, Francis Arnold. Um, and actually, my PhD thesis, you know, while I was in her lab, actually was focused on direct evolution. As you can see, the title of my thesis was uh, called uh, Enzyme Engineering by Direct Evolution. So I developed uh, many of the tools that now currently used uh, you know, in this uh, field. And direct evolution, of course, is not just limited to protein engineering. It also can be used to engineer uh, DNA pathways and the genomes for a wide variety of applications. Right? And um, so it is essentially uh, a design you know, tool. So initially, it was mainly used for protein engineering, as I highlighted in those uh, red boxes. And uh, later, it was used for pathway engineering, which, highlighted, which were highlighted in those green boxes. And uh, over the past 10 years, it was also increasingly used for genome engineering. You know, one example is this uh, MAGE method you know, uh, developed by George Church's group. And uh, in the recent years, uh, many scientists also developed uh, those uh, so-called in vivo continuous evolution uh, strategies, so they can continually, you know, evolve the target the proteins or pathways. Right? So you don't need to uh, analyze the um, the mutants uh, every time in each round, and so you can do it uh, automatically. And so in my lab, actually, just like the first speaker uh, mentioned, is actually focused on synthetic biology. So we are very interested in developing, you know, new synthetic biology tools for many different applications, many actually in the form of a biofoundry, but also we develop many enzyme engineering and uh, um, uh, genome engineering tools based on the CRISPR talents. And then we apply you know, this uh, technology platform for three main applications. One is related to drug discovery and development. Uh, many we are interested in discovering novel natural products from sequenced genomes or beta genomes to discover bioactive compounds that could be used as a uh, antibiotics uh, or anti-cancer drugs. And then in the second uh, main application is that we try to engineer you know, microbial cell factories for production of chemicals and the materials. 
And then lastly, we are also interested in engineering the cells you know, for gene therapy applications, or actually study the chromatin structure and dynamics. And one tool that we use very often in the laboratory is direct evolution, and I will highlight uh, uh, today. But also, one actually major theme is really is the related to um, sustainable, uh, sustainability. So as we all know, um, the chemicals or materials we use nowadays, many produced from um, a biochemical uh, industry uh, using you know, petroleum oils uh, as the feedstock, right? And it is a very well established uh, you know, industry, but it created a lot of uh, pollution or other you know, uh, problems. So the biorefinery or biomanufacturing actually is focused on the development of biological systems, you know, like enzymes or you know, microbial cell factories for production of chemicals and materials uh, using biomass or even you know, carbon dioxide as the feedstock, right? So this clearly is much more you know, sustainable. So today, actually, I want to highlight kind of two uh, examples. One is related to uh, protein engineering, and then the other one is related to uh, microbial cell factory uh, engineering. And they all actually will rely on the direct evolution uh, method that I highlighted in the beginning. So the first example is that we try to create uh, proteins with uh, new functions. And this actually is very challenging and I think most of the protein engineers are focused on the improvement of existing functions, right? And the reason to, uh, it is challenging to create new functions because it may require many simultaneous mutations, meaning more than two or three, right? Uh, while for improving existing function, you only need one, you know, a few you know, mutations uh, uh, individually. And you can do the simple calculation, you know, you understand that why it is so challenging to create uh, uh, new functions. For a typical protein of uh, 300 amino acids, right, if you want to introduce uh, three mutations simultaneously, the library size is already 10 to the 10th, right? And uh, this is already beyond any of the screening method that actually we have uh, developed, right? And uh, if the you know, creation of the new function requires the more than three mutations, that means that you'll never be able to find it. So then how to actually we can solve this problem? So actually, uh, more than 10 years ago, we developed a, a strategy called an in vitro co-evolution strategy. Basically, we try to co-evolve the enzyme with the substrate. So in order to create a new function. So if you look at the, the sequence space here, you know, this is the wild type of protein function. Here is the novel protein function, and they are separate uh, far away. And that's why the novel function is novel, right? So then how actually we can you know, create, uh, uh, how can we actually create that new function? So our idea is to actually um, create some intermediate function, which will be served as a bridge. So we can actually create the protein uh, variants that works for the intermediate uh, function and then gradually you know, reach the target of um, a novel function. Yeah? Uh, that's the, uh, yeah. So as a, a proof of concept, you know, we actually used this um, uh, estrin receptor ligand bind domain as an example. And this uh, protein actually will recognize uh, you know, estradiol uh, as its uh, uh, ligand. And we want to actually make the protein work towards a new compound called corticosterone. And if you look at the chemical structure of corticosterone, it differs from the uh, estradiol at uh, many places, right? But if we can find uh, some intermediate compound that actually differ um, a, a few positions, you know, f compared to the previous uh, compound, so then these compounds can be used as the intermediates. Uh, so like the testosterone or progesterone. And then if you analyze uh, those response for this compound, the wild type protein responded to the estradiol very well at the sub nanomolar concentration but it has uh, no response towards the corticosterone. And also it has no response uh, towards um, uh, progesterone as well. And it has uh, some response towards uh, the testosterone. So then what we did is that uh, we created a library of uh, variants and then used the testosterone as the kind of a target substrate 
first target the substrate and then try to improve its function, right? So we obtained the uh, mutants now showed a further improvement uh, towards the testosterone. And uh, after two rounds of uh, evolution, we found uh, uh, a mutant that also now showed some response towards uh, the uh, progesterone, but still no response towards uh, the corticosterone. And then we actually uh, switch the direct evolution uh, using the uh, progesterone as the substrate. And we did a, a further round of uh, direct evolution and found a, a new mutants that now should uh, improve the response to progesterone, but still no response towards the corticosterone. So we have to do uh, two more rounds, and then eventually we found uh, some uh, two mutants now show the response uh, towards uh, the corticosterone. Right? So this basically enables us uh, to create uh, a new ligand specificity. And uh, this approach actually was used by scientists from Merck and Codexis. So they actually used the same strategy to engineer a transaminase with a new uh, new specificity so that you can target uh, this uh, uh, new you know, uh, uh, substrate, right? And they actually create a, a new process for the synthesis of this uh, Genuvia uh, drug that is used for treatment of diabetes. So they actually commercialized this uh, technology. Now it's made uh, you know, using this uh, engineered uh, enzymes. Okay, and then the second story I want to talk about is that how actually we can really automate uh, the direct evolution process. You know, in the example I showed, you know, we actually spent a lot of time, right? Did many rounds of uh, direct evolution to create a new uh, specificity, but we wonder, is it possible to really automate the entire process? So in order to do that, of course, we have to, you know, use the robotics, right? Or, and also, you know, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I will show you how actually we can combine all these things together to create uh, an automated direct evolution platform. So more than eight years ago, my lab actually developed this uh, first uh, you know, uh, biofoundry uh, called uh, uh, Illinois Biological Foundry for Advanced uh, Biomanufacturing. So what we did is that we integrate uh, you know, many instruments, right, uh, such as the PCR machine, the incubator, uh, uh, or the um, plate reader, etc into a larger platform. And in the center of the platform, there's a robotic arm. The robotic arm basically will take a 96 well plate you know, from one instrument to another. So our idea is to uh, really try to uh, develop a fully automated workflow for synthetic biology applications, including you know, enzyme engineering, protein engineering, pathway engineering. And as we know, this work process, uh, workflows are very complex. So our idea is to break those work processes into uh, workflows into process modules, which will be in turn broken down into unit operations. And those unit operations are generally applicable, so we can program them to create you know, a custom designed uh, uh, workflows. And uh, this uh, idea actually was inspired by the development of uh, computers. So um, actually coincidentally, more than you know, uh, now 70 years ago, a group of uh, uh, um, a faculty from our university built one of the first uh, computers you know, uh, in the world. Uh, um, uh, it's called uh, Illinois Automatic Computer One. And that's why I called uh, our biofoundry called uh, Illinois Biological Foundry for Advanced Biomanufacturing One, right? That's the first generation. So that computer, as you can see, consisted of uh, you know, uh, about uh, 3,000 vacuum tubes. It's basically room size you know, equipment and it weighs about uh, uh, five tons. But the computing power of that computer already exceeded all the computers combined at the Bell Lab at that time. And uh, but for the biofoundry, you know, what we, we try to do is that uh, we want to automate all the steps, right, so that we can do rapid you know, prototyping of biological uh, systems. So if you can think of computers for computing, then the biofoundry is for biomanufacturing. And if you look at the, the uh, uh, computers, because it uh, you know, went through many decades of uh, development. So on our campus, you know, we had uh, many uh, generations of those computers, right? Uh, almost like every six or seven years, there's a new version of the um, system. And currently we have the Blue Waters, which is the one of the fastest uh, you know, supercomputers in, in the world that enables us to do computing anywhere, anytime. 
And so we built this uh, about foundry in 2014, and then we upgraded uh, uh, about uh, two years ago. But I think it will still go through you know, many decades of research and development. So eventually, we will have those kind of bench top biofoundry that we will use in the laboratory for you know, synthetic biology applications. And I'm not alone, although we built the first one, but now many actually uh, uh, institutions around the world are interested in building those biofoundries. So we formed actually a global biofoundry alliance uh, in 2019. And at that time, there were uh, 16 you know, uh, members. And now, actually, there are more than 30 you know, uh, members. It's growing very rapidly. So we try to actually um, you know, develop a, a consortium that will share the technology and also the knowledge. And so in the past uh, you know, uh, few years, we actually developed a few uh, applications based on the biofoundry. The first one, actually, is we developed an automated workflow for synthesis of talents, right? So we could uh, you know, assemble uh, many talents uh, uh, in a very short time, which actually significantly reduced the cost for talent synthesis. Of course, nowadays, most people still use you know, uh, CRISPR for, for genome uh, engineering. But I would argue talent still has some niche applications. And then also, we actually uh, use the robotic system for um, uh, microbial cell engineering as well. So we developed a workflow and we try to improve the yeast with improved tolerance towards acetic acid. Yeah. And more recently, we actually want to automate the entire process. So the way we do it is that uh, we combine the automation with the AI so that we can you know, uh, automate the entire direct evolution process. So here is a one kind of a, a, a proof of concept study. We try to optimize uh, the uh, pathway involved in the synthesis of lycopene, right? And what we did is that we used a robotic system to construct you know, a small library, which only actually like 46 you know, variants. And then we analyze them using the robotic system and then use a machine learning model to make predictions on the combinations of promoters that will lead into improved production of uh, a lycopene. And then we can actually repeat this cycle. So essentially, the whole you know, direct evolution cycle now could be automated uh, by the biofoundry and the uh, um, uh, AI uh, tool. And so actually, this is also a part of uh, the DOE Bioenergy Research Center that I'm involved. So in this center, we have uh, you know, uh, more than you know, 20 you know, uh, faculty uh, involved in the development of uh, new capabilities for the biofoundry, mainly focused on the capabilities for the design field test uh, components of the synthetic biology cycle. And then we applied this uh, biofoundry for engineering of a wide variety of uh, organisms for production of uh, you know, uh, chemicals and uh, biofuels. And in addition, actually, I'm leading an NSF AI research institute in which we try to develop a new AI and a new chemistry that will accelerate uh, the synthesis of uh, molecules and materials. So in this uh, uh, institute, uh, we have uh, you know, uh, more than 17 PIs from different uh, departments, uh, half of them from CS department. The other half is from chemical engineering and chemistry department. So what we try to do is to develop AI tools that can be used for synthesis planning and also optimizing the uh, catalyst performance. That catalyst could include a chemical catalyst or you know, uh, enzymes. And then we actually want to use those uh, tools to synthesize uh, uh, chemicals like drugs you know, in a, a high throughput manner and a more efficient way. Uh, and of course, we also um, try to build a, uh, uh, effort to develop a new workforce as well and uh, involve, uh, develop a new education uh, uh, modules as well. And so in summary, what I show today is that you know, direct evolution is really a powerful tool for engineering of biological systems, including proteins, pathways, and genomes for various applications. So we developed many you know, tools over the years, and I didn't talk about all of them. Today, I only talk about the in vitro coevolution strategy. And then I think that the key message is that you know, if we can combine you know, the automation, uh, machine learning, and the direct evolution, then we really can you know, um, have a new um, platform to engineer a biological system. That also actually represent a new kind of uh, uh, research paradigm that is more data-driven, right? 
So finally, I would like to thank the students who did the most of the work, and I think particularly, I think the funding from, I think DARPA initially to fund the uh, proof of concept study in the bio foundry, and then currently many DOE funded the most of the efforts you know, on the uh, bio foundry development, and NSF, you know, to, for the funding of the uh, development of uh, machine learning AI tools. So thank you for attention. You know, I will be happy to answer questions later. You know. Yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, extremely interesting lecture. And uh, the last lecture in this uh, session it will be presented by Alexander Bugay uh, from uh, Laboratory of Radiation Biology, uh, Dubna, Russia, uh, with the title uh, Radiation in Human Brain Problems on Earth and in Deep Space. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to start my report with deep words of gratitude for this conference and its organizers. So actually the problem of the topic is connected with various threats that humanity encountered mostly in the last century. So what we got? Actually, development of our technology allows the humanity to encounter into the space research, but still there are a lot of problems how to get far and far from the Earth. Until now we have only reached the Moon and this is all at the moment. Why? The problem, why there is such a problem? The problem actually it comes from the great radiation risk in coming from the deep space. Also, at the Earth, we also have a lot of different radiation stress factors, mostly in coming from the technical devices like nuclear stations, electromagnetic signals, and so on and so forth. And also, the humanity tried to use radiation factors not only to damage something, but to use it as a medical tool, mostly in the radiation therapy of cancer. And of course, the need to improve this technique is really and really f f increasing. So, why I am speaking about the brain? Because so many years ago, then the radiation research was started, especially on biological organisms. The brain was considered as the most probably radio-resistant system and nothing cared about its damage. And but until now, there was some warning signals, especially from that field that I'm talking about. The radiation research on the damage of incoming from the cosmic rays allows us to speak about the specific risks incoming from the space radiations. Mostly, when we are coming outside of the Earth magnetosphere, we will get a lot of very high charge and energy particles incoming, and almost no physical protection could be developed to protect the crew of uh, any spacecraft. So, as you can see on this graph with charge spectrum, there are a lot of even heavy elements as heavy charged particles, not only protons or helium ions, but also part of elements up to the iron. And also, those heavy charged particles produce very high damage to the living organisms, mostly on the molecular level. So what we got? If we make a simple simulation using known Monte Carlo codes, we will re eventually realize that very common particles, especially in radiotherapy, produced not so high and heavy structure damage as the particles incoming from the space. 
Here you can see a sampling with typical medical proton beam and heavy iron ions with very high energy. So you can see on the level of the neural tissue, there are, probably will be a lot of damage in, in the cells. So, indeed, our experiments with extremely high and high charge particles revealed that there will be a lot of DNA damage, highly structured and clustered. Here you can see uh, probably one of the world unique experiments with relativistic krypton ions. And when we compare it with typical medical proton beams, there will be a lot of very complicated damage had to re repair and most of the cells probably will eventually die or produce very complex mutations and chromosome aberrations. So, how these molecular events can affect the normal performance of the brain? A lot of experiments were done at the moment mostly on rodents, as this is what we did in our lab. Different behavioral test systems reveal that there will be a permanent decrease in normal behavior and emotional status of the laboratory animals after the irradiations. But still, we may, might to think if the animal model is good to predict very complex performance of the brain. And so we tried to establish very unique experiments on more complex animal models like monkeys. Where there was a big collaboration of the different institutions involved. They constructed very specific test computer systems where animals were pre-trained to solve a variety of different tasks similar to the operator activity in the space crew. So, what we re achieved? In experiments with low-dose gamma rays and protons, the animals behave, behaves almost normally. But if we got in a radiation of, the bra of their brain with even not so high charge carbon ions in the same dose, we will get almost twice reduction in their cognitive functions and learning ability. So the danger is real. And of course, if we launch a space missions, we can get not only some kind of delayed effects, which are of course, mostly risk of cancer induction, but also we may encounter even the risk of successful mission during the flight itself. So this is why we are recalling to the radiation neuroscience research, which can be used to produce such a risk estimations. And moreover, we need to go deeply into the specific mechanisms of the brain damage. There are a lot of mechanisms revealed at the moment. Most of them are connected with molecular damage, then which, which is transferred to the death of radio sensitive cells, which are dividing to also the radiation perturbs blood brain barrier, a lot of Inflammatory and oxidative stress can emerge, which is really long term, up to several months or even more if we use very heavy charge particles. Also, more resistant neural cells can accumulate a lot of mutations, which can produce different pro def defective proteins. And in the result, we may encounter a kind of neurodegenerative disease and whatever. Also, cancer can be triggered. So there is a real and complicated problem how to solve the, this complexity of events. Also, there is a, a very complicated question how to protect from this cosmic radiation. At the moment, most of known radioprotective drugs are typically working with very low 
energy radiation like gamma rays or protons. We did several experiments which were successful in protecting the brain after and or before the irradiation, but still this Drugs work only with very light particles. What we could expect in the future? Actually, several recent works indicated that we can use a kind of gene or cellular therapy to prevent some important targets. Mostly, those works were related to the suppression of the immune system in the brain because it is well established that microglia becomes overactivated after the irradiation and produces a lot of inflammation and oxidative, reactive, oxidative species. So if we deplete somehow the population, we will get a, lo a lot of be benefit to the healthy tissue. And also there are some clues how to protect the population of neural stem cells, astrocytes, and other glial cells, trying to repopulate it or boost the repair systems inside. So probably this could be a really exciting but very complicated process, how to emerge some countermeasures. Also, what about the human itself? Actually, there are some data on the brain damage in the human population, but these data are mostly connected with radiotherapy, late and side effects. Actually, the radiotherapy using photon sources like gamma and X-ray sources are not well covering the tumor site itself, so there is uh, probably rather huge statistics of and compl complicated side effects coming from the several days up to several years. And of course, we need to elaborate a way how to avoid those complications. So, actually, the real solution is to use different particles, mostly hadron beams, like protons, carbon ions, helium ions, and so on. Their beneficial property is to produce so-called bracket peak at the end of the track, so we can focus it inside the tumor site itself, but still there are a plateau before the peak which could produce some side effects. But still, recent statistics told us that if we irradiate the whole brain itself, there will be a lot of possible complications in coming, but if we use particle beams like protons, of course the statistics is not very completed yet, but still the side effects can be strongly reduced. So it's probably a way to specific therapy of brain tumors. But this is why a lot of particle therapy centers are constructed and developed all around the world. There were only a few about 50 or 70 years ago, mostly located in Europe and US, but now we are encountering rapid growth of such kind of facilities, not only the proton centers, but also carbon ions. Some research also use neutron therapies, but it's rather limited in their possibilities up to now, but still we hope to encounter a very huge development in such a technique. So, but still the side effects cannot be probably totally avoided and we need to still manage between most tumor damage and normal tissue complications and also there are some pro pro probable, let's say, financial problems with the development and operational costs of such a huge facilities like carbon ion therapy centers. Also, we need to find ways to improve radiation therapies. There are probably two main strategies how to do this. The one is mostly evident to improve our technique and the second one is revenue but still very promising. It's the usage of so-called multimodal therapy based on modification of different therapeutic strategies 
based on the modification of biological response. So I present a few samples of such strategies. The technical strategy which we are currently focusing in our institute is based on the so-called flashed effect when we use very high intensity and very low duration radiation pulses. In this way, we can avoid the oxidative stress, which typically does a lot of damage to the healthy tissue during the beam propagation to the tumor site. So this is one effect. And another approach is based on the use of special drugs and probably more complicated systems based on the action of DNA synthesis inhibitors, which are working on the, in the field of radiation using the initial very simple damage like base damage and single strand breaks to transfer them into the more complicated DNA double strand breaks, which are very lethal to the living cells. So our initial preliminary experiments indicate that even very radio-resistant tumors like glioblastoma could be efficiently treated with using such an approach. So, also we can speak about the relation between radiation and the induction of different neurodegeneration de de degenerative diseases. There are a lot of clues that there is a, very, a lot of similarity between the radiation-related effects and the mechanisms responsible on the different brain diseases. And indeed, in our research, we see a lot of similarities between the radiation response to the tissue, brain tissue and induction of different neurodegenerative and morphological and behavioral reactions. So if we use the radiation as an instrument in trying to use different physical properties of various beams, we can probably emerge uh, different radiation uh, induced brain diseases. And if we use it widely, we can use some and some approaches revealing the mechanism responsible for the very complicated brain disturbances. So, for example, we can start from the in silico simulations, trying to reveal the whole chain of events responsible for the specific brain diseases. Here, we, can, we started from the study of genetic disorders responsible for different kinds of epilepsy and autism. And if we consider a specific target, like the genes responsible for the glutamatergic synaptic receptors, try, then try to reveal the structural differences, the functionality, then proceed to the, the effect of these mutant proteins on the level of synaptic connections, and moreover, on the level of a small scale brain neural networks, we can actually try to compute the consequences on the macroscopic level, which are, which are possible indicators of, which can be used for medical doctors to distinguish between different disorders. So this is probably a very interesting story how to use the radiation as a tool to study brain diseases. And in the summary, I would like to focus on the three main topics. The first one is related to the proper estimation of radiation risk and finding the way of elaboration of efficient countermeasures, which is not perfect, almost not perfect, I would say, at the moment. Also, the, it's well established probably that particle radiation therapy is beneficial for the treatment of brain tumors, but still there are a lot of efforts need to be done to overcome very high cost of such facilities and to reduce the side effects of such high-tech high te therapy. Also, 
Radiation, as I already mentioned, can be used as a potential research instrument to reveal the mechanisms of different brain diseases. So probably this is it. And thank you for your attention. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Bugay. Uh, now uh, we have uh, some time for discussion. Uh, before discussion, I would like to thank all the speakers today because for, for their wonderful lectures. It was extremely interesting. I'm not in the field, but uh, it was really super interesting to hear uh, everything uh, they said today. Uh, so uh, I would like to invite the speakers to join, join me here. Uh, so now we have the first question, please. Thank you. My name is Laszlo Foro from University of Notre Dame. Question to, to Dr. Yerala. Uh, your artificial proteins, for example, for uh, the insulin management, isn't there a concern of the immune response of the, of the body? I mean, they are, they are as immunogenic as other proteins, so that's the fact, so it depends when, where they are acting, but uh, the fact is that we can design uh, the residues that are exposed, so in the, there's a heptate repeat that defines the cold cold dimers, and four residues are defined for this interaction. At other sites, we can position almost any residue, and we can position them uh, hydrophilic residues that are less immunogenic. So, like any other protein, it could trigger immune response, but we can we can certainly suppress it. Okay, uh, thank you. We have. Uh, yeah, I have uh, a, I have a question for the present pre presentation where uh, it was concluded that periodic uh, short-term fasting has many health benefits. Uh, so, sir, my question is, uh, there are cultures where there is regular fasting uh, on an annual basis, um, and is there an indication that such populations then have lesser prevalence of the kind of uh, illnesses that you were talking about? Um, yes, a very good short-term fasting yields a very um, cute response that you know that, that, that allows the body to survive the period of starvation that is very critical so at the expense of growth you invest into maintenance defense DNA repair um, a slow growth but you upregulate antioxidant defenses and so on so you have an acute advantage by short-term fasting if you um, uh, if people um, uh, have a subsequently uh, a challenge because of surgery or chemotherapy or um, any other, let, let's say, um, a, acute situation where you need your resources, then this helps. Uh, if, and, and the human body can tolerate about, if you are healthy, 40 days of no food. That's why it's called 40-day period in the Bible so, and in other religions. So the body has an enormous potential to protect but it is if you it is only transient so as soon as you have more food the body doesn't invest into the maintenance and then it invests into growth because you have to become an adult and to deliver your progeny so uh, this this is a potent response that is acutely induced with short-term fasting and it's chronically induced when you do calorie restriction so you have constantly a lower amount of food that the body is constantly investing more into maintenance. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, another question. Yeah. <coughs> A question to Dr. Jala. Um, you, uh, I think very justifiably, want to uh, regulate function of uh, cells and so on. Uh, and you mentioned cancer. Now, uh, how would you uh, handle the fact that uh, of heterogeneity? Because uh, a, uh, a cancerous lesion uh, contains uh, a huge 
assortment of different cells, including cancer cells and other cells. And there is a very, very remarkable heterogeneity, intertumor heterogeneity, and, uh, and intra uh, tumor heterogeneity. In other words, cells within a cancerous lesion are very, very, very similar, very dissimilar from each other. So I think this poses a problem in uh, trying to regulate or to find a general way to regulate the uh, function of these of uh, certain circuits. Uh, thank you for your uh, question. So uh, the answer is on, on, on several levels. Uh, the, the example that I uh, presented are therapeutic cells. So they are CAR T cells that are directed against certain uh, cancer antigens. So in this case, this is not an issue, although there may be, of course, the, the, the escape. But of course, we are trying uh, other, other types as well. We recently published a way to target specific cancer, specific mutation uh, using CRISPR-Cas like uh, in Philadelphia chromosome so you can target uh, driver mutations and the, the, mainly in a therapy the goal is really to in, induce immune response of the body release cancer antigens that will then clear up the cancer but but of course the, the issues that you mentioned are certainly very very important yes, thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, question to dr. Bugai so I didn't understand why this your flash doses of aeration uh, would reduce the oxidative stress. I, I, I would think that they oxidize anyhow, <laughs> the, the atoms and molecules. Actually, this is, uh, let's say, a very complicated process. And there are still debates how it actually works. There, firstly, it was discovered as a as an observation in, in specific facilities, but still there are clues. If it, what are the exact mechanisms responsible? Most people consider that very fast beams, like with durations in about of picosecond or even smaller, will encounter less production of reactive oxygen species outside of the, the initial tr tracks. So I'm speaking about the reduction of the diffusion, because if we have very long pulse, the diffusion will be ongoing during the, same, the whole pulse duration. But if we have very short pulse, the diffusion typically would not go outside the precise region where the particle track really is. So this is probably the most typical answer, but still there are some clues that probably other oxygen related mechanisms may be responsible. So this is actually an actively on ongoing research. This is it. Thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? I have a question for Dr. Zhao. Uh, when, when, when we speak about uh, uh, evolution, I mean, for, for, for uh, how to say, it, for non-expert audience, it's, uh, uh, we think about millions of years, right? Uh, but what is the, I mean, uh, for directed evolution, uh, what are the time frames in, in which you can develop some, some uh, specific or, or, or protein with, with some desired function? So just to get some, uh, some idea about the time frames. Yeah, so basically, as I mentioned, uh, <coughs> we try to mimic uh, the Darwinian evolution, the natural evolution process in the test tube because we have the genetic tools to introduce mutations very quickly. So we can actually complete uh, one round of direct evolution in weeks. Right. Not like uh, in hundred years or millions of years, you know. So for the whole direct evolution campaign, it takes uh, you know a few months at the most because you have to do it uh, many many rounds in order to accumulate all those beneficial mutations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, can, yeah. One can more I question. I have a question to to uh, Professor Hey if I pronounce well your name. 
So I didn't get uh, right, so, so Emma, so it wasn't the case of aging, it was uh, genetic damage what happened. So how a fasting helps to repair that damage. So it's, it's not the same as aging, isn't is it right? <laughs> yes, it's a very valid point. Um, yes, we think that DNA damage drives aging. So um, we, we have made many different mouse mutants. We have also the corresponding human uh, diseases. And the, we don't see any difference in the pathology and in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the, the development, for instance, of Alzheimer. And our mouse mutants, and also the children, by the way, develop also uh, protein plaques. And we think now that DNA damage starts the process of aging. So DNA damage leads to functional decline of the genome. It interferes with transcription and thereby causes a lot of consequences because everything starts, every, every biological process starts with DNA. So there you have to transcribe a gene and then the proteins do all the work. But if you have problems with DNA, then you get problems with proteins. So you get incomplete com uh, protein complexes, for instance, you get proteostatic stress. And, and, and as a consequence, proteins that have a high tendency to aggregate, they start aggregating. So it explains all the, the dementia where proteins start aggregating, where the most important risk factor for the dementia, whether it's Alzheimer or Parkinson or Huntington or frontotemporal dementia, is your age. So aging is the most important risk factor for Alzheimer. And aging starts with DNA damage, at least systemic aging. So um, we have it's chemotherapy causes DNA damage. We, we discussed it. Uh, and chemotherapy causes accelerated. So um, there, is, there is so much uh, overwhelming evidence now, and we have published a recent uh, review in Nature, uh, that DNA damage is the, is the root cause of systemic aging, like DNA damage is the root cause of cancer. Thank you very much. It's pity that you are not here. Sorry. <laughs> but I have a question maybe for the uh, process of directed evolution. So um, one of the ways to accelerate directed evolution is to make damage. So or make a mutagenic uh, organism that makes more mutations. So I wonder whether that would facilitate or accelerate uh, directed evolution. Uh, and it, for instance, E. coli, if you put E. coli in a very uh, difficult, um, you know, um, a critical state with uh, a lot of damage, then E. coli will cause an SRS response, which makes more mutations so that E. coli that have the, that have the, the right mutation to allow to escape from the uh, unfavorable uh, development, uh, unfavorable circumstances, can develop and give rise to new progeny. So I was wondering whether that would, in a way, try to further accelerate um, your directed evolution. For me? Yeah, definitely. Because actually before the development of recombinant DNA technology, uh, UV radiation or you know, chemical mutagens are the typical method to introduce mutations. Basically try to challenge the cells and then the cells will come up with more mutations than get the you know, improvement. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, one more question. For Dr. Bugai, uh, thank you very much for a most important and interesting presentation. As plans are becoming finalized for return to the moon and ultimately for astronauts to travel to Mars, uh, do you think that therapeutics may make it possible for astronauts to remain out in the environment for relatively long periods of time, or is most of the time being spent on the moon going to be com confined to uh, lava tubes and other regimes uh, where uh, radiation protection from the high energy galactic cosmic rays can be obtained? Okay, thank you for your question. Actually, the moon mission probably is not so harmful as the Martian one because the distance is not so far. And on the moon, we can establish a more complicated defense systems because it's not so far for the one side. And from the other side, we can go deep inside. We did such calculations before. 
and somehow protect using natural environment of the moon, going in deep inside and protecting from the most harmful particle outcoming. So probably this is the case. So probably this is not so problematic to start a moon mission, but still the risks could be also not so, let's say, dangerous. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion for this question? Is that possible? Um, so I, I showed you that if you have lower food intake, you invest more into maintenance in this survival response, which is also upregulating defense mechanisms and DNA repair. So one way to better protect from uh, radiation, uh, cosmic radiation in space, might be to mimic the situation of the survival response in the uh, astronauts so that they invest more in maintenance at the expense of growth and in that way are better protected against brain damage. You, I showed you the effects of lower food intake in the case of this child Emma that had very severe neurodegeneration but then still uh, was able to improve just simply by less food. So I think there may be an opportunity also for nutritional interventions to improve uh, their resistance uh, against um, adverse uh, circumstances like radiation, but um, the others too, like a fever, uh, like uh, infections, they are all less uh, prominent uh, and less cancer, by the way, too, uh, because you have less mutations. So maybe nutrition keeps also some promise for space research. Thank you very much for your comments. Actually, we started animal experiments of that kind and we partially were promising. The animal were subjected to a specific diet, so probably this is the case, which also works for, for the space radiation. Why not? We can proceed. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, if not, uh, I would like to thank the speakers and everybody who participated in discussion today. Uh, according to the plan, uh, now it's time for a break and the uh, next session will continue soon. Thank you very much.